There we um, go. So our first question we'd like to discuss in this panel is um, if I want to become a tech writer, which skills are important to acquire? And which skill do you think should I focus on first? Who would like to go first? And maybe I have a raise of hands. Jen? Hi, uh, yeah, I'll get that one started. Uh, I get this question a lot. I think it always depends. I always start with a bit of a question as to what area of technical writing you want to go into. I normally find the person asking the question has an idea of what bit of the industry they'd like to go into. Uh, sometimes that means they want to go into software documentation. Sometimes that means they want to go into aircraft manual writing and those are very different things. And so normally I try and find out where someone's coming from and what their ambitions are for where they want to work. Um, if they go for the software docs route, which is obviously my background, um, I would normally say I'll concentrate on building the core set of skills first. So that's being strong in your kind of um, writing in plain English and understanding your users and having a good grasp of technology. Um, and then in terms of the grasping of the technology, again, I think it depends what you, is you want to document. If you want to focus on software, see if you can get your base level coding skills up within a, in a certain language, just to the point that you can read and understand something. To be, able to, to be able to document it, not to the point that necessarily you can go and develop and launch your own API, but be able to read some API endpoints or look at some responses and understand what you're receiving, something like that. So the point of legibility when you're when you're reading um, and then building up those core writing skills alongside. Without either of those things, I think you're going to struggle in the software documentation world. Um, so I'd always argue with those first and then start building up kind of the kind of skills you would need alongside that to be successful as a technical writer um, or any kind of documentarian which is where we never work in isolation. So we will always be in a position where we always want to want to be in a position where we're working with developers or sysadmins or customer support staff, marketing teams, whoever it happens to be. Even if you're a team of two, you need to be able to work very well with the people alongside you, learn how to ask good questions, how to extract information from people that might not be forthcoming, um, how to kind of get stakeholders on board with what you're doing and other things that are happening. So alongside those core kind of tech skills and competencies, uh, your writing skills being strong and then those collaboration and stakeholder management skills that are so important just to be able to get our job done and to be able to get anything out in the world and without those i think you're going to struggle Portia. Yeah, Portia. Go ahead. jump right in like it's 2021 we are beyond the permission-based environment learn how to program keep a blog have a twitter account and ask questions. You'd be surprised like how much attention you'll get after like two or three articles. You'll also be surprised how generous people are with their time when you have questions. Um, once you feel more confident about writing what you're learning in tech, I would go to some open source projects. I would look, I would go to GitHub and I would look for tickets that are um, looking for a technical writer and um, just get started documenting your favorite project. And I just think getting out there is so important and getting started. Is Twitter really the best place to get out there as opposed to LinkedIn or other professional groups like Write Docs Slack channel? It depends. So Twitter is where you reach developers. So if you're looking for like a senior developer or you're looking for on the developer team, you go to Twitter. If you're looking for the hiring team or if you're looking for someone in management, then LinkedIn. I've definitely done both and definitely like reached out to different crowds. Uh, Dustin or Daniel, do you have any um, inputs on this question or any, any skills that, uh, that got, got you where you were maybe? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I think feedback and knowing how to ask for feedback, collecting feedback and acting on feedback is a really important skill. Uh, for me personally, that was something that I had to sort of get used to because I sort of started to take feedback quite personally. And I had to sort of detach myself from the work and my being, you know, someone says, make these changes or, you know, your tone of voice needs to change. There's a few mistakes with your tense. And I am like, are you saying I'm a terrible writer? Like, you know, stuff like that. Um, I think take, learn how to take feedback and act on it and, and sort of learn so that you don't make that mistake again. I guess that's, 
that's on the acting. But mistakes happen, to be honest. But I guess feedback is something that was really big for me and acting on that. Yeah, I, I, I agree for sure. Um, you know, I think one skill that we haven't necessarily talked about is also the, the kind of editing of, you know, not just writing the stuff yourself, but, um, you know, editing it out, but also being willing to be edited. Uh, and, you know, that's what you were saying too, right? And to kind of divorce yourself a little bit from the, from the product and embrace the fact that um, once it's done, it, now, now it's out of date. You know, we're all agile. We're all, uh, I mean, a, a lot of people are <laughs> in now into continuous uh, integration, continuous development. So, you know, it's being, being ready to start improving and just always getting better and not kind of resting on your, on your laurels, I think is an important part of it as well too. And just embracing that kind of it, finding out what's, what's good enough. Uh, and then getting ready to continuously make it that way. And if, if that means that, you know, it's your stuff that's getting changed or the way that you did it is getting changed or you're changing others, it's just kind of this rolling train that keeps going. So actually um, something that you all kind of said uh, in your introductions quite differently. And I think all of us on this call would, would have um, some a lot of big differences as well in terms of background. So some of you have mentioned technical backgrounds, some of you have mentioned literature backgrounds, some of you have mentioned completely different backgrounds. Um, what backgrounds do you think are most common? And this is a, this is a controversial one, most useful to, to be a tech writer. <laughs> How about it's Jit? Okay, Portia, go for it, go for it, jump in. There we go, like you said. <laughs> the best background you need is a background of curiosity and uh, <laughs> being okay with being wrong and like correcting yourself. So, yeah, that's it. I think it all depends on the industry you're applying to. Some industries have more technical background than other. And from my experience, if you're applying for a job in the open source community, you or do you need to be a member of the open source community? You can't just like get hard from nothing. You have to be for done projects first. But academic communities, you can't just like uh, go from zero to nothing in open source. Really? That's I mean, what I've been told. In open source community, you would go to, the best thing for you to do is like go to a meetup. Or if you are remote, you can just ask a bunch of questions. You can answer their questions or like interact with them on Twitter. I know there are several one, projects that I was just able to interact with the person and was able to get to zero to 50. That will lead you to, at least from my, what I was told, that won't lead to an entry level writing position. And definitely, and if you're like in my position, senior level writer, I would could not, I would have to be involved for a few, at least a few products before I could go from there. I feel like this might be a good question to throw to Jen based on this, this sub discussion as well. A, because if my memory serves me correctly, which it may not, you said you came from a literature background, um, but B, also because um, you've definitely hired people across all of those levels. So yeah, um, A, for you, which backgrounds are kind of the most interesting ones and B, which ones have you seen the most, I guess? That's an interesting question. I think the ones I've seen the most might be people uh, gravitating from support engineering jobs, uh, some kind of DevRel-esque sort of role that want to do more more, more writing, um, and a lot of uh, ex-journalists, actually. And there might have been for what we were asking for at the time when I worked in government especially, um, but a lot of it boils down to, to anyone that's been in any kind of role where they've had to have a high level of empathy for who they're writing for. So a journalist is really interested in their audience because they need to write something that's going to get a lot of clicks. Support engineers are very interested in, in writing things that are going to help some kind of end user. Um, and you see sort of the same patterns emerging with high levels of empathy and a high level of curiosity, like Portia said, to investigate something or to help someone to achieve some sort of task. Now, that doesn't mean that anyone outside of those backgrounds doesn't have that um, at all. I've, I've seen that in all sorts of different roles. Um, but those seem to those seem to crop up quite often um, in the roles that I've hired for. Um, and yeah, have always just worked out particularly well. Um, but we've had success from, from lots of different people from those of different backgrounds. What I would say is I wouldn't get too tied up as to where you've been, 
it's more about where you're going and, and how to what the next step is to get there. So I wouldn't let your past background or whichever previous job title you've had or previous company you've worked for that shouldn't hold you back from, from where you want to be next. Um, and it's all about just how you position your experience and finding new experience, like I said, with like, whether that's finding open source projects or something else, just position your experience in the right way to then help you take that next step. Uh, Daniel, I think you and I come from a similar backgrounds that we come from more technical backgrounds. And actually an interesting question that I've been asked that maybe you've heard from people like yourself is, why did you switch to writing and why did you stay a developer? Uh, and I guess, yeah, what in your background made you want to switch from, from that into doing the, the more education communication side of, of the tech industry, should we say? Yeah, I think this is less career wise. I think personally, I am just someone who really likes to put ideas out there. I don't like having them in my head. I don't think they're any useful in my head alone. And um, usually I've been in positions where I, I like to tinker with things and I realize that this is probably helpful for someone and I want to share that. Like development was super fun, um, stressful, but I think writing for me was a better way of expressing things I wanted to and communicating ideas that, um, and expressing myself, um, I guess, creatively in a way that just software alone couldn't. And that was sort of what led to my switch. So I write even outside of um, technical spaces. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my question. So, so, oh. yeah, I don't know. I can't actually remember who it, it might have been. We have a mixture of uh, inputs here. Um, actually, so just coming into that as kind of a, a leveler across some of these um, different backgrounds that people might have, and especially in a, in a, in a I mean, tech generally, but also in, in documentation and tech writing and things like that, there's generally a shortage of people for the roles. So have any of you ever uh, looked at or taken into consideration or used as a, as a measuring stick uh, tech writing certificates? So actually we have some things listed here, EU TechOM framework, the ITC QF. Um, are any of you familiar with any of these or any of these from other countries and are they useful to you in helping you choose who to hire? Maybe uh, Dustin? I, you know, honestly, I have to say, I, I've, we haven't had any applicants who have had any kind of technical writing certifications yet, and I, I certainly don't have one either. Um, I, I think they're very useful, and certainly wouldn't, uh, you know, scoff at some at someone who had gone through that would be really exciting. They'd probably teach us a thing or two about what we've been doing wrong and bang our heads against the wall about why it's not working so well. Um, but as someone who's kind of, and I think uh, a lot of people wind up in in technical writing because they didn't know it existed so they before they had a chance to try it out and, and never got a chance to to kind of study it and then it was all <laughs> all guns blazing um you know once they got started with it um so you know i, I don't consider it necessary but i, th I think that it's really awesome that there is a that there are some ways that we can kind of prove that hey there's a framework there's some best practices there's a certification that we can you know that we can put forward of uh, you know being able to say yeah I've I've I, I've got the skills I've got the experience but I've also you know can prove it with the, the little paperwork. <laughs> Actually, um, I don't know Florian or Florian. I don't know if you're there, Florian Helmschen. You said a tech home certification was quite common where you've worked. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to the chat or pop onto the video quickly to, to tell us um, any more about that? Yeah, uh, where I've worked was uh, medical device software that might explain why they're looking for this kind of certification. And uh, most TCOM certified people, I guess, are more from the traditional world. Uh, I've been working in software for 20 years, but uh, the heavy machinery folks in Germany, uh, among them, it's quite common to have some sort of uh, certification like the TCOM one, which is not that hard to acquire. Uh, I mean, you can also make master, get a master degree, I guess, in technical communications in some places in Germany. I haven't met many of those yet. 
Um, Jen, uh, in, the, in your government background, was there ever any requirements for any kind of cert Well, there's probably requirements for certain certification, but around skills, shall we say? <laughs> uh, probably less than you would think. Uh, we had a lot of conversations about this when we first started hiring, um, because we just wanted to attract people that had the same sort of interest that kind of just wanted to, to fix the right things or wanted to approach a problem in a certain way or could bring different backgrounds to it. And actually, we had a big discussion about Actually, we were worried that putting some list of certifications or even requirements to have a degree would be too much of a barrier for those that we wanted to attract. Um, and so actually we made a distinct um, decision not to not to mention any any particular certificates. I, as well as Justin, I, I don't carry any formal certifications in what I do. Um, and we thought it might be too much of a barrier to entry. So we actually decided not to put any of that on our job descriptions. Um, no, it's not to say they're not valid. We did have people who did apply and we do and GDS still does uh, have people working there who do hold uh, various different certifications, but we never we never made it a, um, a requirement for entry. So if that isn't something that is so common to look for outside of certain fields, which makes some sense, um, what other useful skills do you look for? Uh, I'm going to throw this to Portia, which might be a slightly <laughs> because uh, I don't know if you necessarily are hiring people, but um, what 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 other skills do you think would be useful for people then to to go into a, a change of well, career? I, I have to be field? honest. I hired my first person, uh, my first writer, last month, and I was looking for experience. Like I was looking for someone who could hit the ground running. But as I grow my team, I do want a pathway for people who are curious, but don't have like a formal background in technical writing. So. Yeah. Um, and Daniel, I mean, talking from the perspective of running like a um, community blog, which is actually quite a good, um, uh, Quite a good place for people to get experience and get paid. Um, what kind of experience do you look for there when trying to hire, not, not a permanent hire, but a, someone to come in and do one or two things? Um, yeah, what, what are the skills you look for there? Yeah, um, I can definitely agree. One thing about the platform is really trying to give people somewhere to sort of practice and level up as they get started with uh, technical writing at least and I try and keep that um, bar for entry as low as possible like if someone wants to communicate and that's just me because uh, sometimes I do have the bandwidth to sort of um, not necessarily handhold but give very specific um, you know feedback about certain things and um, how people can improve and you know stuff that would probably work um, or probably shouldn't happen again. Uh, and when I say that, I sound very mean, but I'm not. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty open um, platform for anyone just sort of who wants to express ideas or solutions that they've recently found. And that's mostly what we see happening. There's people who have never written an article before and just have guidelines um, for tone of voice, uh, like flow. And um, yeah, they submit something using the same guidelines and then you know, feedback helps them grow. And I'm seeing um, from the first time someone submits something to like the third time, you can see a huge difference in, in sorry, I need water. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty dry day. This was a question directed at Portia from the chat room, although I actually kind of think it could go to anybody, but I'll let Portia go first. And then I have a question for Dustin actually. Um, how do you assess these skills? I'm guess referring to your last um, statement around hiring someone. How do you assess these skills in an interview process? And I think the second part is something that a lot of us can identify with, um, especially if the bulk of an applicant's experience cannot be shared outside a company or organization. Um, did we just lose Porsche as well? <laughs> I think we did, yeah. Oh. Okay, I'll come back to that then. <laughs> maybe, maybe the question. I mean, I can, was, I can. Yeah, take you go for it, Dustin. You go for it. Sure, because um, I had yep. the same thing when I was applying for my for my first job at, at Mambu. I, I didn't have any kind of a portfolio to share because all of my previous work 
had been for government agencies or for companies with extremely stringent information security policies. Um, so yeah, I had no portfolio whatsoever to, uh, to display other than some work from graduate school, which is uh, not exactly the same genre. Um, but one of the things that, um, that we did as part of uh, the interview process and that I've continued while I hire is uh, we do have an assessment and that, that assessment is generally a editing and rewriting of a section of the documentation that's publicly available. So, I mean, essentially, you know, we're just asking them to do the open source thing, find this section where you think things need to be improved. We point out a section that we think needs, uh, needs some sprucing up and, and kind of let them go at it. And it's pretty much no rules. It's, I don't care if you keep the same format, I don't care if you trash the screenshots, split it up into multiple pages, crush it into one, make a video, just go nuts with it. Um, show us what your flavor is on this. Um, and then on top of that, not only what they deliver as part of the assessment, but I, I pay a lot of attention to the supplementary material. And by that, I mean, the way in which the assessment is turned in, if there are thoughts about, well, this is what I was able to do in the time that I was given. And we, we give ample time and we also tell people like, I don't want you spending a ton of time on this, like time box it, do what you can in this amount of time. But I also wanna know what you think about it. What was hard, what was, what was easy? What would you do next? And you know, kind of what lessons did you learn along the way? And I've had candidates who have turned out to be some of my best hires, whose assessments I thought were pretty crappy to when I first looked at them. And then when we talked about it and they walked me through the process and they said, well, I had trouble because I was trying to do this cool thing with making my own public, you know, like make, uh, making a Doxis code site and the pipeline wasn't working and, and the templates were messed up. Uh, so I kind of skimped on the content here, but I did this really cool thing on the design side. Um, but this is what I would have done had I had the time. And those kind of meta conversations um, tell me a lot about the grit and the way that someone's thinking about the writing process more than what they actually deliver. Because like you said, we, we, don't, we don't write in a vacuum. We don't work in a vacuum. It's, it's a team game. I'm gonna throw this most controversial question to Jen first. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion around it actually in the Write the Dog Slack the past few months around writing tests, um, especially take home ones, which is kind of the only choice at the moment, but um, are they valid? People's time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, what do you feel about writing tests and the efficiency of them, the ethics of them, the, <laughs> the, the various things of them? <laughs> Oh, I love how you got the hard ones at me. Okay, so when I was a writer applying for these, um, I hated them. And then I became a hiring manager and I loved them. So now I see both sides. And as a hiring manager, I tried to remember what it was like being on the receiving end of being asked to do one of these. They can be really, really nasty. So I think there are some ground rules that I tend to set. If you really decide that you need one, then to do it in the just the best way that you could possibly can, which for me means ideally not a take home test. Um, it's ideally someone, if you've asked for some amount of their time, then we, I would previously have tried to slot it next to an interview or something like that. Um, and, and just provide like one set of time to try and time box it and say, it's 15 minutes only, make it really clear exactly what we're looking for. I'm not looking for something that's gonna be word perfect. I'm not expecting you to meet our in-house style when you have no idea what that is. I'm not expecting something to be completely accurate or for your code samples to run. Um, but I would like an opportunity for you to showcase what you've got more to understand your approach to your writing or to editing or whatever I've asked you to do um, and then an opportunity to talk through it so I would always say keep it short keep it very very targeted try and assess for maybe one or two things only so editing so for example for context at GDS um, one of the things we introduced was a writing test which was less of a writing test and more a feedback test so we gave someone a, a very crappy read me and said uh, go away have a look at this for 10-15 minutes decide how you would approach this problem and how you would attempt to rewrite it and what you would like to do and then come in and talk us through that. Um, and then part of the brief was basically have a developer who had written it and pitch to them how you would explain how you would share this feedback with them and if you had a poorly written readme that you'd like to like to um, like to rewrite. And that instead that we weren't assessing how good of a writer they were, it was more how you would approach to, uh, you know, 
yeah, just approach needs to begin that sort of project, as well as how you would begin to give feedback to someone, which for us was more important to assess than the actual writing ability itself. Um, that said, we have, and I have personally kind of made the mistake of hiring uh, people that maybe just needed a bit more support on the writing side. But once we found that out in job, that was very easy to give them some more support and train them up on. Something like giving difficult feedback or working with, I don't know, um, a particularly difficult stakeholder or something like that can be a lot harder to learn on the job. So we decided to shift our writing test to be less about the writing and more about the feedback or about the editing or something else. So providing they're short, they're not asking too much of the candidate. Um, you try to combine it with some other kind of element of the interview process or selection process somehow. Um, and you're really clear on what you're assessing and your expectations of them. I think they can be OK. Um, I get very disappointed when I see someone using something uh, and I have seen this done. I've also been the receiving end of doing a writing test and having submitted something and then someone taking my work, something I have contributed and publishing that in their public docs. That's a no, no, you're going to that's paid work. You should be paying someone for that. That's that's not what writing tests are for. It, that well, that riles me up. That makes me really mad. So providing you're not straying into that territory, I think they could be good, but you need to be really careful about how you use them. Now, Portia has come back. Uh, I think the only way I can rearrange people is to go back into the grid view. So give me a second. For... <laughs> where... Oops, where did she go? Oh, there you are. That's it. All right. Whoop. And back we go. There we go. It's like it never happened. Now, what was the question we actually had for you? Um... Oh, that was it. I think Dustin ended up answering a little bit, but we'll throw it to you as well, Portia, just in, just because someone did actually ask you explicitly. Um, and I think uh, Daniel might have a little bit of input on this as well, because I think definitely the three of us come from more open source backgrounds where we can share pretty much everything we've worked on. But yeah, how, what do you advise to people who have come from backgrounds where they can't share the things they've worked on because it's not public? and not open source and very private and NDAs and things like that. Oh boy, um, this is where side projects come in at. Like um, when I was working full time as a software engineer, it, most of the stuff I could, many of the stuff I could not share. So I always had a portfolio of just fun things I was doing. And a lot of times it was even for career building. A lot of times I was just curious and it was just something that I can do um, outside of work and find out something new. Um, and it's really brought me to places that I've never expected, like professionally, um, having a background, like having apps that I put out there in the world on GitHub, like having a blog. So if your work is mostly like gated or you can't share it, um, be sure to have like a professional identity and a professional life outside of your full time job. And I think um, Laura just posted something in the chat that if you can't share anything you work on, um, showcase your, yeah, your external projects, blog, volunteers, contributions, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, sure. very good point. Daniel, I think I have a perfect one for you. Um, what are the pros and cons of freelancing versus working full-time in a company? <laughs> That's a good one. I mean, um, it gets tough freelancing having a steady flow of um, you know clients sometimes uh, the great thing is once you're up and running usually you sort of build relationships with a lot of your clients and you know I, I think anyone who's done freelancing knows like a majority of their clients are repeat clients and that's that's definitely something that's really cool I remember when freelancing I had more flexibility in, in and I guess uh what, how can I frame this flexibility and sort of uh, I could have my mark on the work that I did you know I could place that mark and um, I had more of like a personal touch um, whereas where you join an organization depending on the size there's, there's certain restrictions in in how um, how you write and what you can you know say and the tone and certain words you use so um, I definitely felt a lot more creative with how I was doing things when I was freelancing. Uh, not that it's completely restricted where I am now. It's just, um, yeah, I, I'm working on so much that I don't necessarily always have time to do stuff that, you know, um, empowers me as a creative. <laughs> and uh, yeah, freelancing, I guess, really helped me uh, fine tune a lot of skills also because you work with a lot of different types of uh, clients, lots of different types of people. You people who will give you 
um, really strong, harsh feedback and you sort of just have to like suck it up. It's not like, you know, um, pounding you per se. Like, it's not that they're terrible people. It's just, you know, it's, it's hard to hear. And there's people who would be very, they'll, they'll really just circle around certain things that you do and you have to sort of gain the, I guess, social skills to pick up certain things. So I think freelancing is a really interesting way of getting a lot of skills really quick if I could say that because I definitely grew quite a bit when I was working with so many types of clients and um, well full-time is really has really been cementing what I learned and well in the position I'm at now helping other people learn that those skills so yeah that sounds that's nice that's, those, those, those it's a very nice ones. way of putting it. you can pass those skills on to other people that's great and Laura just posted another great uh, message, <laughs> um, especially just going back a little bit to the portfolio thing. Yes, the Google season of docs is open for submissions right now where you can work on open source projects and I think get paid. I'm not sure something changed this year, but I'm not 100% sure what, but have a look at it because um, that's actually- You a, do get paid this year. Yeah, you do. That's actually a great um, program to be involved with. Now. I'm going to take a slight um, tangent angle here and we're going to kind of actually no, I'm going to ask one more and then we're going to move up the ladder a little. So, um, Dustin, I'm a new tech writer. I've just got my first job with, with you, maybe. Uh, what's my first year going to look like? I mean, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question when you, when you <laughs> especially on our side, because uh, I had no idea what our, what our first year was going to look like, because I was making it up uh, as we went along. And, you know, one of the things about working for uh, a company that's in the growth phase that I'm in right now is, you know, we've, we've had 100% growth year on year for the last three years. Um, so we, we've seen crazy things happen, <laughs> um, you know, at, even just the, the team grows, the amount of documentation grows all of a sudden it's like, oh, we, we launched a new product and kind of forgot to tell anybody about it. Like quick document everything, <laughs> uh, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of ups and downs. Um, but the, the first, the first, uh, year looks like. First of all, just getting to know the company and our way of working and a lot of review, a lot of reading, um, getting to know the documentation base really well um, and being an incredibly useful resource for us is a, a fresh pair of eyes. Um, we. We love it whenever somebody new comes on the team because they see all the stuff that we've gone blind to. Um, they they check out all those pages that we we know like oh, okay that's no one really uses that uh, or you know oh yeah wrote that three years ago I was hoping everyone uh, else would forget about it too and it's the first thing they find is this thing like you, you guys remember that there's this whole section over here that we haven't touched in forever shh don't you know don't open the red door. Uh, for all of you IT uh, crowd fans out there. Um, but yeah, so it's a, a lot of that, a lot of reviewing. And then we we have, a um, if my team's listening, they'll, they'll be like, yeah, you say we do this, but we haven't actually done it yet. But we kind of cross train a little bit in that um, we, we have different technical writers sort of um, assigned to specific product areas, but we like to try to rotate it around too, to have a, some cross training and to reduce the, the, the bus factor or the lottery factor, depending on whether you like the uh, image of somebody getting hit by a bus or not. But if one of the team members were to uh, no longer be with us, uh, either because they won the lottery or they got hit by a bus, um, you know, would, would we lose all of their, their knowledge? So reducing that, we try to, we try to cross train, we try to rotate through. Um, but there'd be a lot of shadowing and, you know, walking through the process. And then eventually we'd assign you to a group of development teams where you would then do an even deeper dive with them, um, auditing the current documentation, it, getting into that maintenance schedule, and then paying attention to every release and making sure that the, the documentation is updated uh, each with each release and each new feature. Um, 
and then establishing those relationships because I mean a, a big portion of it is not just getting to know the the documentation but the people who are developing the software and the ones who are delivering it to the client and the ones who are using it um, so it's kind of a cheat answer Chris but uh, it's a lot about how we onboard people is is slowly but with lots of review and lots of shadowing and then we kind of uh, you know, guide you through for a while, and eventually you're you're sailing your own ship. But we we keep it uh, we keep it agile, and we keep kind of making little little bits of progress as we go along. We all know that ninety percent of the time, the answer in the tech world is is it depends. So, <laughs> um, okay. So after our first year, we maybe want to start transitioning up the career ladder a little bit. Um, so here's a group of questions. I'm going to group kind of two and a half questions together. And I'll, um, I'll throw this to Jen and Portia first. Um, so first, how do I figure out what skills and competencies, com competencies uh, I want to work on? And feeding into that, what skills do you think are the most important to become a senior tech writer? And what does that growth look like? Um, maybe Jen first. Oh, that's some great questions. Okay, let's try and set that up. Okay, so skills and frameworks and competencies, that kind of thing. Um, I guess it will depend where you're working. If you can see uh, someone in a senior role above you has a senior writer job or something that you know that you want to transition into, I would always go and spend some time with them. Depending on the maturity of your organization, you may have career frameworks or job frameworks that you can look at and go and, and, go and assess against. Um, in most places I've worked at, I'll be honest, those things don't exist. So we have to do a little bit of a gap analysis and where we think we might be and where we want to get to. Um, I think that's quite common in most places. So I wouldn't be put off if you don't find a very neat framework laid out for you. Um, in those situations, I always always have a look at people that might be in parallel roles, even if you don't have a senior writer directly above you, see who's a senior developer or a kind of a tech lead or someone else that you admire and you would like to follow similar S footsteps um, and have a look at the core skills that exist around their job. I find that the further up the ladder as it is that you go, you might find that there are additional skills that are kind of expected of you and you will find more valuable to you that you will end up using in your day to day job a lot more. Uh, I say very waffly terms like stakeholder management, but you end up doing a lot of talking to people who don't aren't as close to the docs as you are. So suddenly you have to spend a lot more of your time explaining what you do, why it's important, why they need to put this meeting with you right now, why are you petitioning for budget, why you need an extra tech writer or something else. And so you actually spend a lot of your time making the case for what you're doing um, a lot more than you perhaps would when you're kind of closer to the docs and, and delivering on the day to day. But have a think about how, how comfortable you feel in those situations. Um, how can you explain what you're doing and then why you're taking the approaches that you have? Um, and alongside that, have a think about other kind of uh, skills that you will do as tech writers and you will naturally do when you're closer to the docs, like project management. Um, you probably already write to a very tight release schedule, for instance. You probably already, you know, write to a deadline or something like that. Uh, the further you move up the ladder, you start to absorb other people's deadlines and other people's project plans. And you need to know your position within that and making sure that you can align other people as well as yourself to make sure that you can meet those deadlines. Um, so having strong project management skills, collaboration skills, stakeholder skills, everything that exists around your bubble. I'd start having a look at what those areas, different areas look like, see where you've got those relationships in the business that you can already start to build or where you might kind of want to eke into a little bit more um, and start to think about, yeah, if you can start to build those up or just get some more experience in doing those things. Um, I find the easiest way to do that is just to ask. Um, people love talking about themselves. Um, so if you go and speak to someone that you admire in the business and say, hi, can you tell me how you got to where you are? What skills did you have? How did you get here? All the questions that you're asking us right now, I went and asked a whole bunch of people when I was at GDS and when I was at Monzo and various other places that I've worked. Um, and everyone had a slightly different answer, but all of them had a core set of skills that have actually been quite useful to just slot on the side of your existing repertoire. Um, and the more of those you build, the more opportunities will open up. If you want to go into someone and say, hi, I want to learn more about project management. Chances are there'll be someone in your business that goes, oh, if you want to learn about project management, do you want to try and project managing this? Just want a little bit of help sorting this out you suddenly get a little bit more experience you get to know a few more people and the next time a big docs project comes along you do it with a bit more confidence your name is attached to it suddenly you get kind of a bit more visibility in the organization and you'll find all these opportunities to start rolling in Portia, i'm going to nuance the question to you ever so slightly to say um how do you move up that ladder in the kind of agency model as well um how do you stop getting the annoying little half a day projects and start getting the bigger, more meaty projects as a, if you're running an agency. 
Oh, running an agency. Um, I'd say most of my projects are meaty. <laughs> well, how did that happen? <laughs> um, positioning. You really have to be, I'll, don't, I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, when you're talking and when you're looking for new clients, it's a two-way street and you have to be really mindful. And I'm very good at saying no to companies that are not a good fit. Because I look at it this way, if I am taking on a small project, then that's wasting my time and I'm not having enough time going for the meaty project. So like when I work with a company, when I talk to a company for the first time, it's a two-way interview. And sometimes I feel like that other company is not the fit, not a good fit, which is fine because they can go to a smaller freelancer or smaller agency that is a good fit. Uh, Daniel, in the developer relations world, which is equally as kind of, um, it's, it's, well, I'm not quite sure the right phrase, so I'm just going to skip over that missing word in that sentence. Um, in the developer relations world, um, is there a similar kind of discussion around seniority and, and junior and, and levels? Like how in that world do people kind of go up and down a career ladder? Oof, I should... I'd love to know that. Uh, well, I've actually been doing what Jen said. It's definitely something on my mind. Um, I've been doing developer relations for two years now. And um, yeah, it's a ladder that I am definitely looking at climbing. And from my research and from what I see, um, I think it's pretty similar to what happens for a lot of technical writers. You sort of start at, you know, hands-on implementation of a lot of things right like you're you're the, you're the person getting hands dirty with you know executing on the strategy and as you sort of climb up the ranks i've seen for developer relations start from um you know uh be like developer advocate or evangelist or uh developer educator and go to you know senior um insert that title there then um that goes to staff and then principal and then director and um, this is that huge um uh, there's that leap upwards and i guess the furthest i've seen at the moment is director and um, as you climb up you do less of the execution and more of you know the, the strategic stuff why are we doing this um looking at what effect that has on you know the overall organization planning projects um, planning sprints for different campaigns um and yeah i can't see as far as director per se, but I definitely know that at um, staff or principal, it's more of supporting people below you also, and helping them be successful and managing them and the overall team. So yeah, I hope that sort of gives people some insight into how people climb up the ranks of developer relations. I'm still very much a one man team, so. Actually, that's, that's a wonderful perspective. I think that's something that people often forget that good managers support their staff, not just tell them what to do. <laughs> so. Well, and I, and I often think, that, think it's best that the, the good managers a ask, what, are, what should we be doing? Um, you know, like, let's make sure we understand stand the problem. Now, what, how, how are we gonna solve it? What do you guys wanna, wanna do? And then be more of a gatekeeper and less of a less of a you know boss like we're going to do it this way because i find that at most times when i think i know how to solve it the first bit of feedback i get from the team is we should go we should do it differently uh and you know yeah. if you have a culture where where the boss says what to do first and is then always has to be right then you never get the challenge you never get the good ideas um you know and like like you were saying the you lose a lot of context um and it's it's hard to let go of the you know getting getting deep into the code and and getting lost in it but you you lose the on the ground context and you start to get all kinds of other contexts and then that's a really important conversation to have because it's what's the best way for the team and then what's the best way for the company and often those aren't the same thing Actually, Justin, I had another question for you, uh, especially because you mentioned having done this, but obviously anyone else who wants to jump in afterwards is more than welcome to. Um, how, what's the transition 
like and when do you know it, it's time to do it I suppose going from being the one person at a company to then actually starting and hopefully it being you but not always we know this sometimes isn't the case starting a team um, how do you do it and when do you know it's the right time to do it I think if you if you are starting to think that it's the right time to do it it's probably already past the right time to do it uh, that was certainly the case on on my side uh, you know I had these fears of, of growing too fast and then having uh, people with nothing to do. And, and that has never been the case. Uh, you know, I inherited a backlog when I came in, I, I fought it down and then uh, we hit another period of growth and it, it skyrocketed. And all of a sudden I was like, I need more hands. I need more people. And, and, and at Mambo too, it, it was never a one man show. We've always had product managers highly involved in writing documentation and the, the technical writing role was almost more of a technical editor. Uh, but even then we hit, we hit problems of, of scale. Um, but, you know, I, I think it, 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 it's an odd transition though, because you really start to know, uh, to notice as, as the team grows or even when you get the first person on, oh crap, I don't have any processes. I just do stuff. Or like, there are moments where, uh, and I, I was just actually talking about this today, where the way that I've been doing something, I, I am, I'm in way too many Slack channels. I've got my ear to the ground all over the place. I'm, I'm talking to people about stuff. And it's partially this, the startup into, uh, you know, corporation scaling that goes on. But there are times when your way that you used to do things now needs to be replaced with a process. And there needs to be discrete documented process and flow of information just to make sure that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. Um, and, you know, you can actually save yourself some of those growing pains by while you're still the one man show of having these sort of having thought about how it's going to scale what your processes are going to be putting them in place at the beginning so that when you do get that budget when you do get that higher when when you do hopefully become the one who's going to lead the team or if not have someone else say that they're going to get the team is that you've got the process you're ready to go you know how it works uh, and that can really ease that transition of course then you have to let go uh, and that's a whole nother story but uh, Jen I don't know if you have any input there I'm not entirely sure if you always went into the teams at GDS and and um, Monzo or yeah, or were you ever just the only person and then made a team? Do you have any input there? Uh, so when I joined GDS, I was one of the first tech writers they had and then sort of had grew the team that was already a little bit established. So that was a bit of an easier ride. Um, and then I came to Monzo and, and grew something from scratch. So I was the first one in. So I've, I've seen it both both ways. Um, similar in, in both situations. So it was on me to make the case to the organization that it was ready or that I was ready or something was ready. Um, on that personal note there about you feeling ready, I don't think you'll ever get to that point. If you ever try and wait for everything to be perfectly aligned and you feel professionally you're ready to take that next stage, I agree with Justin, I think that point is already gone. I think you probably are ready earlier than you think and you learn so fast on the job when you become a senior or you become a manager. Um, but I think there's two elements to it. There's one element that's kind of increasing seniority um, in the kind of the tech writing, the documentation side, and then there's the kind of the people management side. Um, and the people management side can be a bit of a different strand and depending on how things work in your organization or moving somewhere else, those two things might mean the same thing. So being a senior in one, in one job might mean you do both those things, senior in someone else's job might mean you just focus on one of those things. So you need to kind of know which direction you would like to do. And if you'd like to do a bit of people management, that's a good thing to know. If you don't fancy that at any point in your career, again, that's completely fine. It's a really useful thing to know. Um, and it's difficult to know when to make that jump, but try it and see what happens. It's the easiest way to find out. <laughs> okay, Daniel and Portia, I think I have some questions here to, to get you kicking off. This is kind of loosely around trends and communities. Um, tech writing may not move quite as fast as the developer ecosystem, but it moves fairly fast. Um, and there's always new things to learn, new things to find out about. Um, what do you think are some of the 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 trends the the practices that aspiring and wanting to grow uh, documentarians should be learning right now it's a controversial one and secondly where should they be finding out about those i only have a biased answer for this <laughs> and i think uh one should learn 
open source technologies like Git. One should learn the Jamstack. One should learn how to like put a site together, how to deploy it on a service like Amplify or Netlify, like just have those basic tech skills. They should definitely learn Markdown. And I think those are foundational skills that will um, serve one well. Now, Daniel, knowing who you work for, I think you're going to have a very similar answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, sort of. I I'm, I'm a big fan of Markdown. I I love it. Uh, so I'm sort of biased. Also, um, definitely learn Markdown. Um, on platforms, I I don't think that at this point, and I'm speaking from a very um, like tech writer tutorial type perspective where people put out or have like on host personal blogs and have some sort of writing portfolio. I think now, um, and I love that you mentioned community, now it's much easier to get the benefits of growing with different communities that you know offer platforms to have um, like your portfolio in public where there's platforms like dev and um, Hashnode is growing really quick now. And I think, Portia mentioned this at the beginning, Twitter is, an, is a very interesting place. I think it's a really good place for conversations. Um, and you can post an article that you put out on your personal blog or you know one of these platforms and have really um, interesting conversations around that. I think it's, I think that's a trend. That's definitely a trend. Twitter has become quite big. I don't know how long that will be for. Um, and in terms of platforms, dev was like the, the de facto for quite a bit. Uh, I think that's where you would find all developers. And right now, Hashnode is making um, a number of waves in like the developer um, ecosystem. So uh, that that's definitely something I would say, like I, I would say like, you know, create a create an account. Like if you feel like you can't get um, your own like Jaco blog up, your own Hugo blog up, like just create an account on all of those platforms, start to put stuff out. And I'm sure you will um, figure something out. But like, if you want to get like really deep into it, uh, you know, put something like Gatsby or Strappy and uh, <laughs> I knew Chris was waiting for that. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, build your blog, start writing and um, share share your stuff, I think. Uh, okay. I see digital gardens actually making quite a big, uh, they're quite the trend at the moment. You're even mentioning services I've never heard of, so this is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jen and Dustin, what about at the big end of town? What are the what are the, the skills and communities to find out about those skills and trends at, at your end in the kind of enterprise world? I'll go ahead, Jen. I think we were just looking at <laughs> you're you gonna do this, am I gonna do this? Um, gosh, you know, I I'm not really sure there there's all that much of a, of a difference necessarily i think it's just get don't um let me rephrase that don't be afraid to continue getting your hands dirty you know don't forget where you where you come from uh in that sense um and and you know stay abreast of things but you might not necessarily need to get as deep into it as you as you might before um i i don't know i'm trying to uh, kind of think of of examples but you know, when you learn Markdown, it kind of becomes the the way of life. And I've started like taking my notes and it actually, yeah, I don't publish it anywhere, but I actually have a, a, a Hugo blog that I use to take my own like journal type notes, but it just lives locally. So I can look at it when it's pretty uh, or I can look at it when it's, when it's nerdy, but I'm constantly messing with it, but just incrementally, because you don't necessarily get a lot of time to do those deep dives. So you start to to play with things, um, to just mess with stuff, and then and then abandoned it um, has been helpful for me. Um, but you know, as far as which communities, I'm not sure it's any different. I just uh, would recommend trying to stay abreast of the recent developments in in more large scale concepts of um, of cloud. Com computing, thinking about clusters and, um, you know, Kubernetes and things like that too, just getting a sense of what the, the next step of, of scale is um, from one or two blogs and thinking of all times about how, how 
further automation could could change things you know what if the steps that are manual now don't need to be manual later uh, have that kind of drive your thinking yeah i would completely agree with that particularly your point about it not changing that much uh, i actually find it's the opposite if you work for a smaller organization you get to try the fun stuff you get to try the smaller tools you get more fun you go and work for an enterprise you're locked into a big old documentation legacy system that's going to leave you tearing your hair out um, I'm battling one right now. I wish I could go back to using Docs as code and having some fun with middleman and everything, but right now I just can't. So I'm stuck with the tools that my company is currently using. I might try and get them off them, but it's going to take me a while. So try and enjoy that bit where you've got some time to learn new things. And you'd be surprised the stuff that you're learning now, uh, it will be mind blowing to some people when you walk into the big enterprise space. Um, case in point at Monzo, we're talking about maybe moving some of our technical docs and more of a Docs as code model. Some of the engineers there haven't seen that before. So like, wow, you can just stick all these. I can have it Git-based. I want Markdown. I can put it all this. I can, we're looking at Spotify's backstage uh, platform. It's blowing some people's minds because they didn't know it was an option because they're so used to seeing things at enterprise level where it's just a bit gnarly and a bit horrible. Um, but all these things that you're learning now, all these tools and everything you're using for your personal portfolios will be just super, super helpful once you're in any any environment, let alone big enterprise. So I wouldn't get too hung up on that, on that difference between small and large. And uh, on the subject of Backstage by Spotify, if, if anyone from their marketing team is listening, let them talk at things, please. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions as we lead out maybe into a, an open conversation. Um, the, here's an interesting one. Here's an interesting one. Feel free, whoever wants to jump in on this first. If you weren't working where you're working or you're looking for a new job tomorrow, what would you be looking for in a role or in an interview process that would make you think this is a, this is a job I want, this is, they're doing the right things here. Now, what do you look for in a job you're applying for? Whoever wants to go first there. <laughs> I want to be like a broken record. <laughs> um, I open source technology. I know it's lame, but I definitely would want to work for a company that was using open source technology. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too honest here. Companies are weird. Like you go through all these hoops to work full time and they don't really know what the atmosphere is like until you spend like two or three months there. I don't know how to solve for that problem. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that, that I'd say then, it, it's it's completely not necessarily um, related to the technical aspects of work, but look for a company that thinks of you as a human being and not a resource, um, you know, and that's going to let you have a life and a job and uh, and let the two coexist in a way that makes sense. And I know we're all kind of coming up with new ways of, of making that bargain for ourselves when coming up on year of lockdown for a lot of us uh, transitioning to, to work at home, um, but also you know companies that just because your life and your work have blurred a little bit more, aren't gonna expect you to put in those extra hours just because you happen to be sitting at your desk all day and that you can, when you have to take those three hours out in the middle of the day at short notice, um, you know that that kind of understands that, that that's always been a big thing for me. It's part of why I um, relocated to Germany, um, you know, specifically for, for this job, but also because, you know, a lot of the companies I'd worked for in the U S they just expected you to be on call all the time and always thinking about work. Um, you know, so that that's my, my, my key thing. I think that's a really important point. Just find the things that really matter to you, that kind of you really care about. Have a look at your existing job and what you like and what you don't like. Um, for me, that means um, looking at a company that has a kind of a really strong user focus. So really, really seems to care about its users and about its customers. Um, you can tell that quite quickly from the amount of time and effort they spend on things like the support articles already or any kind of external facing content. Uh, but also just if they have user researchers in their team or if they take a bit of a, if they hire data scientists or anyone that kind of spends time gathering kind of useful insights about their customer that normally gives me quite a good indication that I might be able to go and spend some time with future readers and write some good docs for them. Um, but also I'm also really interested to know if someone's got a job advert out, I always want to know who sponsored the job. 
So is this come, has this come from your CTO? Is it CTO that's like pushing for tech writers in your organization? Is it someone in marketing that thinks they just need a bit of help with this? How senior is the role? Where do they see it sitting in the org chart or whatever it happens to be? And these things, it's quite hard to find out when you first look at the job ad, but I always find try and find someone in the company that you can speak to who's behind the advert to ask these sort of questions. It'll give you a good indication of how they view the job and how they value the job. Um, for me, I, I struggle in those environments where I constantly have to justify why I'm here. I, I've done that enough too much in previous careers. I don't want to justify why documentation is important. I just want to get on with my job. So if you tell me that the CTO responded it and they're the one pushing for these jobs, then I know that I'm probably going to be in quite a good place. Um, if I'm going to be sidelined, maybe not. Daniel, what, uh, yeah. what attracted um, you to your job? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Um, I think I'll start with what uh, Portia said about open source. And for me, open source is less about like the software and more about the values. I think values are super important. Uh, like, you know, transparency um, is, is super big. Like how, how does information flow? Like are, are things and working remotely, which I am, I think that's super important to be in the know of a lot of things and not just have things fly over my head uh, that's 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 super important and treating people like people and not resources is also um, really big and personally for me community focus is really huge because I feel like if you're if you've got your eyes um, focused on helping solve the problem that your community has then you're probably going in the right direction and I think it's um, it's it's also about you know trust it's it's as much as an interview for for them as it is for you and you know think about what what you want and what you what you can say yes to what you like what you would not allow happening at a you know at a company you would want to work at and try and find out how things are like you know who 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 like who has buy-in on this role like like jen said like will i have to defend myself will you know will i always be like you know constantly feeling like I might lose my job or I'm not adding value, like uh, all these questions you have to sort of ask yourself, you know, when you look at your next row. And these are sort of questions I ask myself. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be at a really cool company. Now, I'm going to use this question. It's a slightly odd question to do this, but I'm going to use this question as a bridge to opening up the, the room a bit more, because I'm pretty sure that the panelists may not have an answer to this question, but I know some people on the call will. <laughs> uh, and that is um, actually, I think most of us, well, not most of us, but the four people on the, on the panel are mostly working in um, software-esque places, but there's a lot of tech writers actually in hardware, in uh, machinery, industrial machinery, especially in a lot of Europe, medical equipment, things like that. So anyone who has a bit more knowledge and experience in those sectors, here's a question for you if you feel like answering. Um, what are the particular skills required for tech writers in those sorts of fields? Uh, and anyone who wants to just pop up and answer that, go ahead. I'm sure there's some of you out there. <laughs> no. I I have ah. um yeah, I have a little bit of experience in that field, not much, but what I found is that you need to be very, 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 very precise. Um you can't um you can't do anything creative. Um you have to make sure that there's no possible misunderstanding um, if something some a screw needs to be tightened you have to specify which screw to what talk and so you need to um, yeah you also need to know a bit about you need to be able to talk to um, the technical people and learn their language uh, but I guess that's yeah I guess that's no different from writing software-esque stuff but yeah, so the, the main difference is in the precision, I would say, because there, there are also there are a lot of um, people can actually die <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you get it wrong. 
there yeah, was anything that has a has a, a an element of regulatory compliance uh you know the stakes are a bit higher you know a, a comma splice in the technical documentation is a little different than uh you know getting an allergen wrong on a food packaging or something which is uh you know something we used to run into so that there's there's a there is a sense of uh working memory there you know for the for the rate people have to keep regulatory compliance in mind and the precision there's a lot of stuff that you either have to have at your fingertips or sort of in your working memory while while you're working on it or, or double checking um you know because those little slip ups that might go past or you know don't matter as much in the software documentation necessarily um you know that yeah the stakes the stakes are a bunch higher um there was a talk at some write the docs in Prague a couple of years ago from someone who documents Google data centers. And that was quite fascinating because it's like the documentation has to be offline for something that makes a lot of things online, <laughs> which was quite a strange talk, but quite interesting. I'm not sure what year to go back and have a look, but uh, there was somewhere in there. Does anyone else have any input on this subject? I can see a few people discussing in the, in the chat as well, if you're interested in uh, you know, a bit more on the, on the topic, but oh, yep, Jill, you were definitely one of those people in that chat. So go ahead. Yeah, but I'm not the best person to talk about it because I fled that field to work in software documentation and for good reasons, because I found it incredibly frustrating because everything had to be past the test house. And there were Germans on the test house that put in English sentences that were horrible and they stayed in documentation because they decided they had to go in there. So the use of shell reigned supreme, drove me nuts. And uh, everybody always tells you there, nobody reads the documentation, we not just need to have it. And if you can deal with that, you're a tougher person than I am. I, after a couple of years, I couldn't. So now we can at least pretend that someone reads the book. And this is, but it's also, you learn really, really interesting stuff. Nobody else will see. So I was on wind energy plants and stuff like that, which is cool, but I still had to describe them, which is tough. So it's for really um, weird parts of the world that you can get to see, that's cool. But I prefer software. It's also <laughs> less cold than wind energy plant in February in Brandenburg. <laughs> All right, I will. Um, switch this back to the gallery view. And if um, anyone wants to want to, firstly, I think maybe we should just thank um, our speakers before we descend into a uh, just general chit chat. So um, thanks very much, Portia. Thanks very much, Dustin. Thanks very much, Jen. Thanks very much, Daniel. And thanks very much to Eva for helping behind the scenes as well. <laughs> With silent claps. <laughs> Very straight. Um, and yeah, if, if anyone just wants to um, chat about the subjects, ask some more questions, then just go ahead, unmute and go crazy. I don't go crazy, but uh, go ahead. <laughs> I don't know if that went through, but thank you, Chris. I heard. I just, uh, I just carried on. <laughs> Or am I going to sit here in awkward silence? Someone must have something they want to say. Well, just a, a quick corollary. I try to, to sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Dustin, Dustin has been responsible for sing, sing the lyrics or whatever it's called that write the docs in Prague for the past ah, okay, two years. Cool. So <laughs> I won't say I was responsible. I was, I was present. Uh, <laughs> there was some conducting involved. Uh, <laughs> okay. I don't know if that's going to be terribly easy to recreate virtually, though. I'm afraid. <laughs> Actually, I think, and, and, and Andrea, I think it was also part of that. <laughs> Maybe. May I, I mean, we could... <laughs> have a question on blogs? Mm? Uh, which, sorry, say it again. Um, I'm looking in the chat and it says, sorry to fix it on blogs, but I'd oh. love any recommendations for good models. Ah, oh, okay. Models for blogs. Um, Daniel, maybe you probably got a good one, good input on this. Good, good models for running your own, contributing to, I guess. Yeah, I'll, I'll need a bit more context before I can answer anything. Does anyone who? Uh, ah. I have one 
this recommendation, which is don't go to Wix ever. <laughs> <laughs> they, you have, they don't give you, you don't get files. You have to, like, if you ever want to leave Wix, it's manual backups all the way. Whoa. <laughs> um, Ouch. I mean, so actually, I, I mean, I will recommend Daniel's uh, GitHub repository. I think, what, is it? what is it, Daniel? Come on, we've got to find it. Um, it's a list of programs. Let me yeah, see if I can uh, send that. Over. It's a list of blogs. That, so basically, content marketing at various tech companies, but they tend to be far more um, pleasant to work for than the, con the, the word content marketing may um, may fill you with fear. But they actually tend to be kind of quite nice and pay quite well. And you can just, oh, there we go. It's in the chat. Um, yeah. And they're good for experimenting and things like that. Um, actually, here's an interesting question that someone just asked, uh, sort of spe specifically in regard to Berlin. But I think this probably applies to Amsterdam, maybe Barcelona, maybe some other places. Um, it's, it's kind of a skills question <laughs> around um, so yeah, we are all, well, the, all three of us speaking here based in Berlin are writing in English, yes. Um, and I personally found that I came to Berlin just at the right time when they wanted, especially here, lots of uh, English language writers uh, for companies and there were very few. So I was very lucky <laughs> at the time. Uh, and I don't know if anyone can speak for any other like major European cities for that similar sort of experience that um, they actually wanted the English skills, not the skills of the, the local language. I don't know if anyone else has those sorts of experiences or, or not, or... Deadly silence, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the fact that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the startups are centered around the, you know, Berlin and, and Amsterdam and Barcelona too, is that, you know, that at least right now they're, they're looking for the English language writers, English, you know, professionally, but also, um, you know, people who want to be able to, to, you know, exist in that. I don't know. I can't fathom it. I can't fathom personally living somewhere where I don't, speak the language and it's kind of funny i always expected i would get a job in germany because i spent years learning german and teaching german and then i wound up working for a company that didn't give a crap that i spoke german and just wanted me to write in english um you know that's not my cup of tea but there's huge expat communities in in all of these in all of these places um you know and i'm seeing a lot of stuff coming through the uh the chat too that yeah there's not necessarily a ton of german companies here or not german software companies um you know, I think it's probably similar in other places too. Yeah, we find that uh, in Israel, the um, the tech writing community is mostly immigrants, expats from you know English speaking areas, or people who grew up with you know English speaking parents in the home. Uh, and it's it's one of the things that like you come to a new country and you feel like you you have to learn a new language, and how are you ever going to thrive? And this is like one of the greatest opportunities to a native English speaker, like you've just got this skill set, you know, based on nothing else, but the fact that you are good at your language. Uh, and then you learn and you, you do better. But uh, it's it's a really yes. good, it's a really, it's you know, for people. It once was though. Uh, it's, it's still like, you know, I, I, I find that the vast majority of writers in Israel are, uh, you know, Anglos. No, but like you need more than just English. To get started. No, 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 but it's a leg up. Uh, yeah. It, no, it depends. I think it depends on the company and what they're looking for. And do they have a team? Can they guide you? Like if you're just starting out versus if you've already got experience um, mm -hmm. in the field. No, for sure. I Actually, will say, oh. in my case, having Hebrew is a leg up. I would just right, like, I, I've never worked at those companies. <laughs> I would just like to throw a question. I, I, this is me being very Anglo. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your first name. Iona Loana uh, from Romania. I don't know if you want to, um, you're also putting in a, 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 a perspective on this from your part of the world. I don't know if you want to, if, if everything you want to say is in the chat or if you want to say anything more. 
Uh, I think pretty much everything was in the chat. It's okay. you, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a webcam. Yeah, so uh, I, I have I know very very few native English speakers who work as technical writers here. Um, actually, only one guy who is Romanian but lived in the States for most of his life and came back. The rest of us are just Romanians who learned English and we're writing in English. And actually, from a European context, uh, it was sort of in one of the questions, but we didn't really answer it fully. Outside of Write the Docs and let's say Techom, which does exist in various parts of Europe, are there any other communities you recommend for upskilling, for learning, um, for finding out trends and things like that, apart from any of those? Any that we've missed that people want to, to throw in for good development? UX writing club, no? Laura and Christoph, I'm sure you want to throw one in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you are the dogs. There we go. <laughs> There's also a, uh, a really great Slack group called Content Plus UX. And, yep. Uh, yep. They're wonderful. Yep. Yep. I had to hop off the call. I don't know if anyone mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Support driven. That's a nice one. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Party Corgi. <laughs> Do you want to explain more, Portia? Sure? <laughs> that doesn't sound very... Oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love the Party Corgi Discord. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll look that Let up. me see if I can get it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Amazing. Cool. Well, we've just gone half past. I think that's probably a nice time to end. I know for some of you in the Middle East and Africa, it's later. Actually, in Eastern Europe, it's also later as well. So um, let's let's wrap up there. Again, thank you very much, everybody. Um, thanks again to Eva. She's been very quiet, but she more than anything motivated the meetup to start again for the first time in a year. So. <laughs> so. So thank you very much. And thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to see so many people coming together. And we should really repeat it again. I think it's, yeah, it's really great. Yep. And I have plenty of new topics, but yeah, we can also brainstorm together. So I think we had between 50 and 70 people most of the time, which is pretty cool. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. This will go up on YouTube as well. So tell your friends, tell your colleagues, whatever. <laughs> and um, yeah. Thanks very much for joining us and um, see you next time at another European city. <laughs> Take care. Or EMEA city, sorry. <laughs>